addressed by um, a very interesting master's degree thesis that I read recently. Um, it's actually, uh, I guess, was done in, in 2007 by Martin Chung, who is uh, uh, a student at the University of Hong Kong. Um, and it's called Sin and Shame. And he tries to compare uh, the, the German experience of repentance after World War II with what is perceived to be the uh, non-repentance of the Japanese after that, uh, after the war. And he goes through a lot of different um, discussions concerning um, uh, the Christian background versus, well, the Shinto background of the two countries and a lot of other things which I, I can't get into, but uh, it's you know from a political scientist point of view, but uh, he also mentions the notion of forgiveness, and I think that that's very important because one has to apologize. But on the other hand, the others, the other side has to forgive as well, and I think that there needs to be this dialogue between uh, the, the the people who have survived who are survivors of the perpetrators and those who have survived who are survivors of the victims. And both sides need to have a dialogue where one makes an apology and where the other uh, uh, offers forgiveness. And I think that that's where there's a, you know, a, a lockdown in that. And, and I wanted to also say that, that I shared in that lockdown, I have other poems which I did not read that are from the point of view of uh, cursing the, 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 the perpetrators. And um, uh, so they're, they're much more politically uh, based uh, or politically motivated than the ones that I read today. Um, and, and so I think that, the, um, you know, I have, uh, I have a, in my abstract that I, I think is, that was printed, that uh, there is this sense for me, an obligation to bear witness, to give voice to the people who uh, could not give voice because uh, they did not survive. Um, uh, they were the victims. And, and this bearing uh, witness or, or giving voice to me is one way to start Again, the dialogue to get out of this logjam so that uh, we can start this process of repentance and forgiveness. And I think that's the only way that Professor Wong will ever go to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Jacob. I don't really know what I should say. I'm actually thinking aloud, and you may not like what I'm thinking aloud. Uh, I agree with what this lady said, that there's a lot of politics involved in every war. And uh, uh, there's no denying that uh, Professor Loeb is a very powerful poet. But I think, uh, this is my personal point of view, that by writing such poems in 1937, and now we are in 2010, by writing such poems and talking about terrible incidents that happened three, four generations ago, we are actually perpetuating hate. Is that what we really want to do? I would also like to mention uh, something else. Uh, you know, India and Pakistan were one country at one time, and then there's been a lot of hate, you know, between the two countries. And we always thought that uh, we, this is how we were trained. This was in 1947 that we got independence and the partition took place. We were told that they are terrible people, they are bad, they are, they are the worst possible thing. But then I read something from their point of view. You see, there are always two sides to a picture. And then I realized that they have also suffered as much as we have suffered, right? Now, even if there isn't another side of uh, another side to the picture, if, I mean, now there is some interaction between Pakistan and India, if I had to go to Pakistan and attend a conference where everybody was talking terrible things about what Indians had done, I would be very, very uncomfortable. And I personally think that a poet as fine as should, instead of writing such poems to which I personally would not respond, you know, um, gouging out eyes and uh, flying flesh and tearing off skin and uh, burning off uh, limbs 
I'm sorry, I cannot respond to it because it brings out the worst side of human beings. And I would much rather, I know it is there, but then if I focus more and more on it, I am actually, you know, making that side stronger. So there is another side to talk about beauty. There is so much of beauty in the positive aspects of life. Sure, we cannot do without hate. We cannot avoid hate altogether, but there has to be something to neutralize it. And if you keep on harping on hate, 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 what are you going to do? You have an international conference, you bring people from all parts of the world and say, these are our enemies, this is what they do to us. It's not right. Forgive me for saying this, but I think somebody needs to say it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I thought that, um, and I still believe I was, in my mind, speaking to the beauty in the poems. And um, yeah, well, but I, I think, I, I think if somebody else in the audience would like to respond to that point, because it's, it's a, I think it's a common, the health point. I think it's a familiar idea, and I think this is a good time for all of you to jump in. <laughs> I'm Howard. <laughs> I actually don't want to let go of uh, Gates' important question about how exactly to create contemplative spaces, especially about events of this sort, which involve mass death and blood and gore, injury, right? Um, uh, which, if you're not careful, uh, if you think in fact they can even be contemplatable, uh, uh, that does not get you uh, very far from pornography. Forget about, you know, forget about perpetuating hate, right? I mean, you know, you can actually end up creating your own vile kind of pornography, right? Um, but I think it's very important that the medium is poetry. <coughs> and it's very important that you have uh, an incredible reader of poetry like Gail um, on the table here. Um, so, Actually, when I was uh, thinking about it, the first thought that came to my mind, almost like as a sort of reflex, was the literature classroom is one contemplative space, right? And it's not just the literature classroom, but the classroom where we teach poetry um, to our students and um, teach them all the elements and teach them about the beauty of poetic language and, and all that. Um, um, but. I would like actually to follow Gail's point about the singularity of this experience right now because while I was listening first to the reading of the poems by the poet a living, and the living, uh, as a living voice, right? The, the voice in the room. Uh, and then eventually um, listen to Gail's reading of the poems. I, I found myself doing curious things like closing my eyes and, and and, and uh, just letting the words of Quintet um, do the work of creating the images, right? And it's very interesting because it's the words, uh, you know, it's the words that create the images. I mean, you know, I'm not looking at any of the gory pictures at all. And there, there's a sense in which, you know, when it's words that do this work of visuality uh, of like something like this, which anybody in, in his or her right mind would not even dare to look at, right? Especially if the photographs are graphic. Um, something of that kind of like um, possibility of the pornographic is mitigated, right? Like, in fact, uh, 